Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our webinar titled Employing Electrophysiology and Optogenetics to Measure and Manipulate Neuronal Activity in Laboratory Animals. This is Martin Hess from Inside Scientific and I will be your host for today's event. We are looking forward to an exciting session today sponsored by Cambridge Neurotech that will highlight and describe a new generation of silicone neural probes that are purpose designed for recording large-scale neuronal ensembles with high spatial resolution in both acute and chronic experiments, targeting multiple brain areas in parallel with excellent chronic stability, and seamless integration with light delivery for optogenetic approaches. You will learn what silicone neural probes are and how to use them in both acute and chronic experiments, best practices for surgical implantation in species ranging from mice to monkeys, and how to integrate fiber optic cannulas with your probes to enable simultaneous optoelectrophysiology. Our goal today is that you leave this webinar armed with the information and know-how required to deploy these versatile tools in your own lab. Our speaker for today's webinar is Dr. Tal Holtzman, the founder and CEO of Cambridge Neurotech. Tal has over 16 years of experience in neural circuits and systems electrophysiology research and an in-depth knowledge of anatomy and surgical approaches relevant to recording complex multimodal signals. His expertise covers all manner of multi-electrode recording techniques relevant to anesthetized, head-fixed and freely behaving animals, and extending to behavioral pharmacology and optogenetics. So uh, we start with an overview of the talk. What are, what are we going to do? The talk's going to be in two parts. Uh, the first part will give you a, a, a general top-down view of what are silicon probes, what kind of data can you expect to gain with them, and how can you integrate optogenetics with them. We'll look at some, a couple of case studies, real-world examples. And in the second half of the talk, we will look at the procedures for mechanically handling the probes, mounting them on miniature drives, and implanting them, either as single simple implants or as multiple target implants. I just want to start with a cautionary tale. Uh, this is one of my first experiments uh, playing around with optogenetics from uh, 2012, 2013. The experiment was done in uh, rat centering on uh, cortex, and we've got CAMK2 neurons expressing halo rhodopsin. So presumably these are projection neurons, pyramidal neurons. What we see in panel A is uh, two raw traces of just raw data and the spikes from the CAMK2 neuron highlighted in dark blue. When I shine uh, five seconds of yellow-green light, as expected, halo rhodopsin is activated and the spiking of that CAMK2 neuron is suppressed. In uh, panels B, you can see the PSTH for that neuron. Now, the cautionary note arises here when we look at some other trials, uh, such as shown as the second trial, where we've got two different neurons shown in C and D, so light blue and uh, red spikes. These neurons who are paradoxically excited during the halo rhodopsin stimulation uh, period. Now it's unclear why that might be, this could be disinhibition or who knows what, but the, the takeaway message from this is that um, if you're using optogenetics and behavior, only behavior is your readout, there's an awful lot of information you're missing and there's also a potential danger that you might attribute causation to, in this case, CAMK2 neurons, because those are the ones that you know are being affected by the light. But if you were to imagine that neurons C and D, we don't know what they are, but let's imagine they were sending collaterals to other cortical columns or other areas, it might be the case that they're the causal agents. And so I think my message here is that neither technique alone, electrophysiology is primarily observational and optogenetics is potentially establishing causation, but neither alone, perhaps as strong as they could be. And so there's a very strong and compelling argument to combine them such that you could uh, monitor during the manipulation within a given microcircuit. But of course, microcircuits don't operate alone. The networks are diffuse and they're in multiple locations across the brain. So we also need something that scales to meet that challenge. So it's combining electrophysiology and optogenetics and then taking it to as much of the brain as we can uh, without, of course, compromising the animal. That's a hard challenge, but I hope to leave you by the end of this hour with uh, at least a toolbox that can go some way, considerable way, to meeting that challenge. 
So I want to show you what kind of data you can expect from uh, one of these probes. And we'll start with a short video from a laboratory who have no prior experience in, in this kind of electrophysiology. Um, so let's just play that. What you're going to see is 32 channels of data. It's live streaming data from a probe implanted in the uh, frontal cortex of a rat. On each channel, you're looking at voltage over time. So you can see single unit spikes flying through the air as the rat goes about its business. Um, practically every channel has some information on it. And the trick now is to pass this data to spike sorting software and work out each of those different shapes and times, who, who, do they, who those spikes belong to, how many neurons are we actually looking at. We'll come back to that with some data examples, but before we do that, I want to describe the, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with silicon probes, what these things actually look like under the microscope. They're made using uh, techniques borrowed from the semiconductor industry, uh, thinking about microchips, and computer chips, and so on, although these devices are considerably more simple. On the right-hand side, we can see a micrograph with uh, a thin sliver, or shank that we call it, of silicon, silicon rather, and that is uh, 70 microns wide and 15 microns thick. So it's a pretty slender, it's thinner than a human hair. And we've got lines patterned on the surface, we can see here going to the outside world, and these dark blobs at the end of the lines are in fact our electrodes. So the first thing that to appreciate is that we have tremendous precision over uh, electrode positioning in terms of uh, spacing and in terms of electrode properties, and we can pack a lot of electrodes into a very small space. And I think really the important thing here is to think about minimal tissue damage. We want to study neurons, they're quite small, they're quite fragile, and actually it would be nice if we could keep them alive for longer than a few hours and potentially study them over days or weeks. So minimal tissue invasion is certainly important, and, and these kind of miniature devices speak very well to that problem. In the cartoons, I've drawn uh, uh, just a library of probe designs that are, are available, and I've drawn them up with scale with respect to each other to show you that we can go right down to extremely fine features. Uh, our smallest electrodes are five by five microns, spaced just 10 microns apart, all the way up to the H3 design, which is offering an electrode every 20 microns, uh, covering nearly 1300 microns. So let's put some context to that and think about, well, how do those things actually uh, marry up with microanatomy in the brain? So in the panels here, I've just taken some schematics and superimposed, for example, in the principal cell layer of the hippocampus, we've got our HP design, which is five shanks, of uh, clusters of electrodes, these planar electrode arrays. And you can see here an individual pyramidal neuron, and you might say, well, oh, that's great. I've got six, seven electrodes next to this uh, neuron, but I only need one, surely. Well, in fact, there are a whole load of other pyramidal neurons clustering uh, are, are clustered around this. And so the more electrodes we can pack into a tighter space, in other words, spatial oversampling, the better we can resolve the signals to individual single units. So the fact that we see the same spike on multiple from the same neuron on multiple adjacent electrodes may seem redundant. And in fact, that redundancy is the silicon probe's greatest strength when it comes to data processing and spike sorting. In panel B, we've got the uh, tiny electrodes, the H1 design, so five by five micron site. And here I've just put a, alongside a uh, juxtacellular filled granule cell. This is um, work from a, a number of years ago quite hard quite hard to label these cells. They are the smallest units in the brain, typically about five or six microns at the soma. And um, good, good fun trying. But anyway, you can see now that if you think about the uh, electrode array as a fishing net, if you want to catch small fish, you need a fine net. And when you look at the scale of those electrodes alongside the smallest units in the brain, then they're not gonna slip through. The trade-off for those, you're only recording from 80 microns of tissue, that's quite a lot of granule cells packed in there, but it, uh, you'll, still, you'll still record from the larger neurons too, but you're only surveying a very small section of tissue. In contrast to panel C, where we've got the H3 probe, we have a probe electrode every 25, uh, sorry, over 20 microns, and we're able to span multiple layers of the cortex. And of course, the trade-off here is we don't want to lose single unit resolution, hence the, the fine granularity of the net, if you will, but we can still spread it out in, in a lengthways way to give us the cortical layers. Another trade-off is the probe size. We don't want it to be too large, and crucially, just for some context here, this width 
of this H3 probe is just under 80 microns. That's really you know, a couple of neurons. So we're going to try and slide this thing into the brain, and we'll, we'll talk in part two about how we get deliver these probes into, into the brain for real experiments. I want to spend a moment. Um, many of you are using tetrodes as, as your go-to uh, technology for recording units. For those of you who are unfamiliar with a tetrode, it is a, a quartet of fine four twisted wires, essentially. You can see here in the photomicrograph, uh, the cut end of one is a wire surrounded by insulation. So each of these are your electrodes. If I put that alongside the probe that we've already seen, you can see there's some big differences. Um, primarily, the probes are made by machines, and they're extremely precise, extremely repeatable, and very well controlled. That's very hard to do with a handmade tetrode. Tetrodes do have a long heritage, and indeed, uh, a Nobel Prize was not so long ago claimed uh, on, the, on the back of a tetrode experiment. However, I think when you stop to consider the advantages that probes offer, it's worth pausing for a moment to think, well, hmm, is it worth switching? Of course, I'm biased. The answer is a yes, but let me explain why I think so. First of all, um, tetrodes do have a skill burden associated with them. You've got to make them, usually by hand. Uh, shown here in the lower image, we've got uh, the micro-mechanical assembly, the drive, for moving each of those tetrodes. It's effectively a collection of screws that you turn the screw up and down, and the, and the tetrode will move up and down in the brain. And they're all in, a group of them would be independently movable. That uh, might take a skilled pair of hands a, a day or two to assemble and test. And um, that, 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 that's time that could be spent doing other tasks, in my mind. You can see from the micrograph that, in fact, silicon probes offer a greater density of channels within a smaller area, so we can pack more in with causing less tissue damage, less tissue displacement. Um, shorter lead time to data and cost efficiency. What I mean by that is that once you've built the system, tetrodes usually require a few days, perhaps a week or more, of careful individual adjustment to get everything on target where you might want it. For example, if you were thinking about pyramidal cell layer in the hippocampus. That's a lot of time. And um, you're not doing your experiment over that time period. You're, you're just adjusting everything. Probes, in contrast, you can get to your target within one to two days, perhaps instead of one to two weeks. So I think although the upfront cost of a probe might be considerably higher on paper than tetrodes, when you take into account your cost of labor, perhaps the costs are about even. But in one situation, I would argue you're working smarter with the latest technology versus working harder to get the same outcome. In terms of mechanics, um, we almost also must consider the size of the animals we work with. And of course, mice are predominantly the go-to species for optogenetics. That is changing, of course, but uh, mice are not going to get any bigger. So it really pushes the limits of what we can pack onto an animal, both in terms of size uh, and in terms of weight. Now, in the graph at the bottom, we've got uh, a series of different tetrode configurations, different tetrode devices plotted with the channel capacities, so that's the number of electrodes, versus the weight on the animal's head. And an adult mouse weighing about 30 grams or so has a sort of maximum limit of about four grams. And I think that's a limit, not a target. So if we look at uh, the pictures at the top, you can see also, even though the device might not weigh very much, mechanically it's quite large. And on the rat, we have a, a similar version on the rat here. In contrast, in the lower image, we have a probe implant, in this case, 64 channels. And you can see that, in fact, there's a considerable saving in terms of size. These are movable probes. The drives are hidden behind the connector here in part of the implant. And if we just plot those for the channel capacity versus weight here, you can see in blue, we have considerable savings in weight and size. The second point to make is that uh, because of the complexity of tetro drives, it's not always convenient to add in fiber optics or fluid delivery cannulas or other items that you might care to, to integrate with your experiment. That is a problem which is solved with the nano drive, which is mentioned here, which we'll talk about in a moment. This is the drive for moving the probes. And of course, if you want to scale to multiple brain areas, the smaller your mechanical footprint, the easier that is. And of course, it is possible to have tetras going to multiple brain areas by splitting the guide tubes apart. But again, uh, not always possible to get where you want. What does a probe look like? Um, there are two flavors. The front end, that is the part that goes in the brain, is identical. So we have here our silicon shank with our planar electrode array. 
and then we connect to a what we call an interface chip. So this joins the probe to something else. In the case of an acute probe, so these are probes for head fixed or anesthetized animals, um, the interface chip connects to a printed circuit board shown here and connects us to the outside world. So these are probes that are easy to pick up and handle and reuse many times. In contrast, a chronic probe um, from the interface chip upwards is connected with a very thin flexible ribbon cable up to a pair of uh, kinetics, uh, omnetics connectors that mate with the majority of mainstream head stages that people will be familiar with. Um, the interface chip serves not just to connect the probe to the flexible cable, but also is a surface, a flat registration surface to mate the probe to the nano drive, which is shown here alongside a probe. Uh, essentially, the nano drive, we'll look at that in more detail in a moment, it's a screw, a fancy screw in a box. These grooves are designed to hold fiber optics, so we can put the fiber optics right alongside the probe and give good registration between the two. We've talked a little bit about probes versus tetros. I want to spend a moment talking about the probes I offer versus those that came before or comp competing technologies. In this video, uh, you'll see one of, one of the interesting features, which is the probes that we make are very, very thin. They're only 15 microns thick, and at worst, they're under 80 microns wide. So size matters in terms of keeping neurons happy and promoting their survival. The, the byproduct is that these very, people think, oh, these are very, very slim and delicate. They're going to be easy to break. But of course, flexibility and thickness are related in a power relationship. So as you can see from the video, you can really abuse a probe quite dramatically uh, before it will break. Now, that, that curvature is not likely to happen in the brain, but I do think um, I like to say from an acute probe perspective, uh, graduate students do tend to have accidents. Probes are not necessarily uh, super cheap, but these are somewhat graduate student proof. The second point, and more importantly, is that having a device that is flexible to some extent can help mitigate the compliance mismatch between the implant and the, and the brain tissue itself, the probe and the, and the tissue. A second and very important feature of this technology is uh, improvements in electrode impedance. And uh, why does that matter? Well, the lower the impedance, the lower the noise added into the system by the electrode. So typically for our electrodes, they're around about 50 kilo ohms. That's a substantial improvement over previous technology or current state of the art. Very importantly for optogenetics um, is the simple physics that when light hits metal, it can uh, cause electrons to jump around and your head stage amplifiers are likely to pick this up and uh, may even fool you into thinking that what you're seeing are spikes. So. Um, there are two ways you can address that problem. Three, perhaps, you can, you can sort of iteratively play around with the positioning of your light source with respect to your electrode and sort of hope that you stumble upon a, a happy configuration where your artifacts are minimal. That's a bit of black magic. Second thing is you could do post-processing on your data. You could identify the artifacts and subtract it out. Um, but perhaps better still is what we've attempted to do, which is engineer the problem from the source by uh, cloaking, if you will, the electrodes and reducing the amount of light that hits them and altering the chemistry of the silicon itself to try and quench induced currents before they make it to your amplifier. So in a sense, within safe working ranges of light power that you would be using for optogenetics, you're highly unlikely to see uh, artifacts that you will care about. They should be under the radar and we'll look at some real life data examples to that effect. Finally, um, just a mechanical question for those people working with chronic implants, which is uh, silicon probes are quite small and, and, and fiddly to handle, and it's not always been easy to align them up with uh, the drives. Our interface chip solves that problem. So quite a simple solution, just a couple of building blocks, really. Um, and that problem is taken care of. So on to data. I'm going to start with this slide because uh, it, it's, it's got a lot of personal meaning for me. This was data I obtained in uh, 2013. The experiment was freely behaving medial prefrontal cortex in, in rats, and uh, we're looking at one quarter of a probe, just as an example. We have the electrodes here, just for scale. These are 11 by 15 micrometers, and they're 25 microns apart. Each color-coded column represents a single unit that's been spike sorted with a free open source software called Costaquick. I recommend it. It's purpose written for these kind of electrode arrays. And uh, you can see here we have 15 or 16 neurons 
uh, just organized by depth and rainbow colored for, for aesthetics. This is very important to me because this is the data that persuaded me to launch the company and get the technology out to the rest of the community. And the reason for that is that this animal has been uh, running around for 60 days with the probe in its head. And for the last 30 days, this probe has just been parked up, not moved. And uh, this, this is the data that was, that was there at the end of the experiment. I thought, well, wow, you know, I had not hitherto seen this kind of data uh, in any of my chronic implants with other technologies. My first reaction was to call up the software developers of ClusterQuick at uh, University College London, Ken Harris's lab, and say, Ken, I think there's a fault in your beta software here. I don't believe it. There can't be this many neurons. Turns out I was mistaken, and uh, in fact, this was, this was an excellent result led to many good things. So why might this be happening? How are we getting good chronic stability? Part of that's down to minimally, minimally invasive probes. Part of it's down to the surgery protocol. There's no single answer, but it is a, a, a phenomenon which is repeatable, and I'll show you that in a moment. Second thing, if you can now have a technology that's able to keep neurons alive in the same location for extended periods of time, how do you know they're the same neurons? There are three ways you could attempt to answer this problem. Perhaps one of them is response properties. Not sure that that's a safe one because that's plastic. It might change or it, perhaps the neurons are. It's not clear what they respond to. An obvious one is waveform shape. But if we just take a moment to look at these waveforms, uh, we can see here in the penultimate column, the magenta, these two electrodes are next to each other. So it's these two sites on the probe. They're just 25 microns apart and the waveforms are radically different. So if the probe were to, or the brain were to move 25 microns tomorrow, between now and tomorrow, I wouldn't be able to say this was the same neuron based on waveform. However, there is something interesting here, which is that the action potential flips polarity. So we can conclude that the dipole for this neuron, that is the, the action potential generating segment, is between these two electrodes. We can conclude the same for this neuron, and there's another one illustrated here and here. So we've now got four dipole landmarks. I'm going to just raise the question that possibly one of the advantages of these planar electrode arrays, apart from the obvious ones of great signals and long-term stability, is uh, a way in to address that problem of identifying neurons over time. We can use landmarks a little bit like if your telescope moves, Orion still looks like Orion. It's a constellation of stars don't, doesn't change just because your viewpoint does. Um, here are those two, uh, just pulled out those two neurons, just uh, plotted as they are referenced spatially. So somewhere here is the dipole location, and then say for this neuron, a little bit deeper down between these two sites. Group data, just to convince you that just wasn't a, a one-off. We've got four animals plotted in, in this graph. We have number of days without moving the probe. So in experimental time, this starts at day 30 and goes to day 60. So we've got 30 days without moving. Number of neurons you start with, two rats in cortex and two rats in striatum. And the take-home message here is that although the numbers you start with are different, different parts of the brain, different layers and so on, uh, they're pretty much the same at the end of a month. Um, couldn't tell you for sure that these are exactly the same neurons, but it's, it's, there's a compelling story to believe that some of them will be. In contrast, many of the electrodes I'd tried prior to this would crash. Uh, perhaps the numbers would come down or hit zero or, or come to low levels after a day or two. And that therefore necessitates the need to move through the brain to find fresh tissue. I think if you have performance like this, moving through the brain becomes an option rather than a necessity. It also opens up a lot of interesting questions of studying longer term, slower processes as well. Just to confirm that this is not only uh, uh, me that can do it, here's uh, a replication of that same experiment from Florian Boehner in Germany. So a probe implanted in the medial prefrontal cortex in a rat, groups of 16 electrodes. And what we see here from each of those four shanks is the uh, uh, data from each, each electrode, groups of 16, and we can see spikes across all of them. And the interesting thing here is Florian's put the probe in and left the animal for two weeks and come back and plugged it in. So again, this probe hasn't moved for two weeks. Some independent examples in different brain areas. Uh, on the left, we have data from hippocampus. Again, same format. Each column is a single unit. Spike sort of cluster quick. Just a little uh, blow up here of sharp wave ripples and so on. This is from Eva Pastelkova at Genelia. And on the right-hand side here, this is awake head fix mouse thalamus during uh, whisking from Carl Svoboda's lab just down the corridor, also at Genelia. 
I'm going to spend a moment now to talk about how we integrate um, the probes with uh, the ability to move them and how that lends itself to co-aligning with fiber optics. And the device that achieves that for us is the nano drive. These, are, as I've mentioned, these are essentially a screw in a box. This is the screw head at the top and the shuttle surface is here. This moves up and down 200 microns a turn of the, per turn of the screw and your probe and your fiber optics will line up with that surface. On the back side, we have clips for cement fixation. These are made from stainless steel. They're very small, they're very light. The engineering tolerances are around about two microns. So these are arguably the smallest and most robust drives developed for neuroscience applications. And uh, it's, it's perhaps overkill, but I do think it's very important when you think about other drive choices uh, mechanical robustness is a key factor in promoting chronic stability. If you have probes that are taking less than true courses or wobbling around, that can kill neurons and promote scar tissue formation. So perhaps it's not over-engineered after all. This is the sort of tolerances that we should be thinking about in contrast to, say, 3D printed technology, which is appealingly cheap, but perhaps doesn't meet the requirement for mechanical stability in some cases. Here we show how the nano drive uh, can be loaded with fiber optic. So there's a drive sitting on the bench here. You can see the uh, as an alignment ridge on the shuttle. This serves to uh, line up the probe for us. And if we look at the finished product over here, this black part is the uh, um, interface chip on our probe, and that lines up perfectly with the drive. So they're, they're designed to mate together. And then in the surface of the drive shuttle, you can see little grooves in different positions. These grooves will accommodate, in this example, fiber optics. But of course, uh, you could even put fluid delivery cannulas in there and even combine fluid delivery cannulas with fibers to make truly multifunctional implants. The configuration is such that the electrodes are facing the uh, light and there's a gap between the fiber optic and the electrodes and that's very deliberate. In this image we'll see a different kind of fiber which most, most of you may be familiar with the flat tips which shine light downwards in a cone. In this case we have a mirror tip which is going to take advantage of the fact that our electrodes are planar, on, if you can just about see here on the probe, and the electrodes are facing the light. So if we look at the power density map for those emission patterns here on the right, um, we can see a silicon probe and we have two choices of the distance, defined distance between the probe and the fiber. 300 or 650 microns. And the electrodes are on this side of the probe facing towards the light. So why separate the fiber from the probe? Why not just put them together, or glue them together? Well, we know that probes are minimally invasive and reasonably well tolerated for keeping neurons alive. The same cannot be said for fiber optics. They're considerably larger, considerably stiffer, and pretty good at killing cells. So all we need to do really is spill enough light towards our electrodes. Um, but not compromise the, the, the mechanical performance of the probe itself, hence the, the deliberate separation between the two elements. However, because they're mounted on the drive together, the two things will move together through the brain. So even if you chose not to put a probe on here, just having the ability to move the fiber optic alone is an advance for, for most optogenetic research. Some real world examples. Um, here we have a flat tip fiber somewhere above an electrode array in a mouse where we have channel rhodopsin 2 expressed in medium spiny neurons in the striatum. So this is data from Max Liu and Anatole Kreitzer. Um, what we see on the right hand side here is a stimulus histogram and some raw traces of data when the light is uh, activated, in a very modest amount of light actually we can see around about 10 milliseconds or so single unit spikes evoked in this medium spiny neuron. Um, most people, when they think about photo-identifying single units, um, uh, would be right to say, well, that's quite a long latency, isn't it? Shouldn't we see spikes within one or two milliseconds pretty quick? But in this case, medium spiny neurons have a profound resting hyperpolarization. So uh, the interpretation is it takes a little bit longer to warm them up, so to speak. In this example, we have a mirror tip configuration, similar kind of electrodes, we're just looking at one trace. We can see, I'll play the video here on the left, we can see the mouse has a fiber optic cable coming in and a 16 channel head stage attached, and it's quite happy, given the small size of this implant, it's quite happy to ambulate around and explore its arena. 
Um, in the data, we can see a sort of natural rhythmic uh, pattern of that spiking activity in this particular neuron, which is altered by the presence of a brief pulse of light. And if we zoom in on that, we can see here indicated by the arrows when we have uh, photo-evoked spikes. I've highlighted this for a particular reason, which, again, thinking about uh, mirror tips and shining light just where you need it, and, and thinking about those variable but set distances between probe and fiber. For me, the goal is to always use as, as little light power as you can get away with. Um, I originally started, like most of my colleagues, thinking, well, light doesn't go very far through the brain. Let's really turn it up. In fact, it's surprising how little light one needs, especially with uh, newer opsins to get stable activation. Perhaps one of interpretation of what's happening here with multi-unit activity is that there are a bunch of other neurons nearby, not quite resolved on this electrode, who are firing at broadly similar times and contributing a sort of compound or multi-unit action potentials. Where this could be a problem is um, potentially this uh, spike here is, is one of our single unit spikes that we care about, but it's superimposed with other stuff going on. So it's quite hard to resolve that and, and separate it out. So I think it speaks strongly in favor of just having the ability to, if you, if you will, dial down the power and just tease out different neurons that within this sort of setting, we've got lots of them expressing the same opsin closely packed together. And each of them will have a different threshold and you, you'll get most of them out. In this example, uh, it's an awake head fixed mouse where we have channel rhodopsin expressed in presynaptic inputs. And this is a cerebellar granule cell. So it's again using a, a very small site probe. And uh, we, for various reasons, if you, if you care about the, the identification process, we believe this to be a granule cell that we've got the data for here. And 10 milliwatts of blue light generates a modest uh, increase in spiking during the stimulus. That is interpreted to be sort of extra postsynaptic drive, or rather presynaptic drive, pardon me, from the mossy fibers. If we just zoom into the beginning of that, uh, we can see there's a little bit of what we interpret to be field potential breakthrough. This is uh, you know, thousands of synapses, perhaps even tens of thousands of synapses being co-activated by the light. And then we see the first of the granule cell spikes within a few, within 10 milliseconds or so, and so on. Um, this is, I think, important in as much as to say we believe this to be the smallest neuron in the brain. The short of axons, there's really nothing harder to record from. And uh, you can even do um, optogenetics with, with those really quite tricky elements and, and work in the comfort that any artifacts you might see are simply not going to hold you back from resolving spikes. We have... Um, I'll start here with the finished product. This is what we're aiming for ultimately, which is very small, low profile implants. And, and ideally, um, let's not forget the, uh, the surgeon as well. So some neuroscience implants, electrophysiology implants can be really quite taxing and demanding, six to eight hours longer of surgery. Um, I'm, I would rather give our surgeons and experimenters headaches than our animals, but better if we can both leave at the end of the day free from headaches. So in this example, what we've got is uh, a dual implant, it's bilateral cortex, bilateral pre uh, orbital frontal cortex on one side, prefrontal on the other in this rat. Two nano drives, we can see the screw heads here and then the connectors for the probe, so two times 32 channels. This is um, a, si a single probe implant can be done in less than two hours start to finish. Slightly longer for the multi-probe or multi-target implants, but not certainly not double. And as you can see, um, if you remember back to our anatomy of the chronic probes, they have a flexible cable. We're free to position these connectors really anywhere we want in the implant. So it makes it very easy to reconfigure for different anatomical targets. You're not constrained too much by the, the mechanics of the probe and the drive. I just want to make a quick um, remark about the importance of stereotactic accuracy. Um, I think there are many costs involved in experiments with probes, drives, the training of the animals, your need to meet funding deadlines and of course your labor and personnel. Um, this is a system, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it, but this system which is designed to address those potential problems of, of accuracy by doing 3D individual animal error correction and automating the drilling. I'll just play this movie very quickly and it's, it's in a mouse. What you're looking at is impedance-based drilling. Uh, so whenever the drill tip gets wet, it stops automatically. The command in this case is to cut a window for imaging. Um, this video is sped up, but it's, it's all uh, being done by a robot, a motorized stereotactic frame. You've corrected for all of the misalignment of the skull. 
you've done the drilling, and of course, uh, on the same uh, tool set, there's an integrated micro-injector as well. So one can imagine doing this, doing your viral injection, if that's what you need to do, and then within the same uh, error-corrected stereotactic coordinate set, implanting your probe, parking the probe above target, and doing everything all in one go. We know that the probes are quite happy to sit in the brain for extended periods of time, and you could then move down to your, to your viral area or your absent expressing area and have confidence that you're all in registration and that you're not necessarily um, working on mistargeted animals. So if you want to find out more, uh, visit the website, click this link, and I'd be delighted to show you how that works. But I like to think of it as a, an efficiency and a cost-saving investment. Wasted animals are certainly very expensive. Um, on to the mechanics of building an implant. The first stage is to pick up a drive and mount it in the stereotactic holding tool. You'll notice here the screw head is, it, we hold the drive by the screw head, so we have full 360 degree access around the drive for surgery. The probe and the fiber optics will mount here onto the shuttle. And this cutout surface is designed to accommodate the fiber optic ferrule. Probes come in a simple box uh, held down by adhesive to release them. Uh, simply use a little bit of uh, solvent just to dissolve the um, uh, adhesive, and then you'll find you can pick your probe out of the box. Hold it by the connector is, is generally safe. With the drive mounted on the bench, um, the holder tool serves to present that surface uppermost to you. The sh shuttle surface here, I put a little bit of superglue gel. Rather than traditional superglue, this is somewhat slower setting and allows you to just nudge and, and, and uh, align the uh, interface chip here, the black part of the probe, to register with this alignment ridge on the drive shuttle. When you're satisfied that you've aligned your probe, um, a little bit of gentle pressure to initiate the bond, and you're good to go. Next thing to do is just to stabilize the connector, uh, a little bit of sticky putty here or sticky tape just to hold the connector temporarily, for, keep it out of the way for surgery. When you've done that, uh, what we now do is um, apply Vaseline. We melt Vaseline, so just, just a low temperature disposable cautery and just gently melt the Vaseline so it runs onto the surface of the drive. In this case, we've got the probe, the side of the shuttle. So the reason for doing this is that any surface that needs to move needs to be free of cement. And so we use Vaseline to repel the cement. So this includes the, the probe interface chip, the sides of the shuttle inside here with the drive screw and so on. In fact, we'll do a little bit more than that. Um, here you can see uh, we we'll just take a pause from the Vaseline. We, we would solder your, you would solder your ground and reference wires to these attachment points, depending on your head stage configuration. And then here we have a probe ready for implantation. Now in this example, I've put more Vaseline on than I normally would, just to illustrate the point. But any surface that needs to move, flexible cables, probes, and so on, is protected. I've also put a film of Vaseline here on the stereotactic holder, because what we're going to do in the next step is implant this device and then bring the cement all the way above the drive and in fact up the holder tool so that when we release this holder tool the screw which is hidden inside here will be countersunk into the implant. So onto the surgery itself in, and just to re recap in terms of mounting the probe and soldering your wires that is a task that once proficient should take you about 10 to 15 minutes. When we come to the surgery um, we make a craniotomy. We're here looking at a picture of a rat surgery, and I've made a durotomy in this case. We can just about see the probe. There's two shanks going in here, uh, just partially into the brain. When it comes to uh, durotomy, there are two choices, um, mechanical or chemical. And the I prefer, it depends on your target. Um, mechanical requires repair, which we'll talk about in the next slide with a, a silicone gel. Chemical requires time, so 20 to 30 minutes, let's say, for the enzyme, a collagenase enzyme, to work on softening the connective tissue in the dura. There's a danger that if you don't wash away all of the collagenase enzyme, that it will continue to digest and reach the peel surface, and then you'll have bleeding everywhere. So if, you are, if, if you're going for superficial recording, top layer cortex, for example, then chemical durotomy is the right choice, provided you wash it away. Otherwise, it rather defeats the point of the exercise. In this example, though, we've cut the dura just large enough to accommodate the probe. And then here I've flooded the durotomy with uh, two-part silicone gel. There's a published paper here you can find out more about if, if you wish. And uh, this is a soft membrane that uh, is completely brain-friendly and, more importantly, soft enough for the probes to move through.
we'll talk at the end of this procedure about how you can use a modified version of this for acute head fixed animals uh, and also similarly a modified version for large animals say primate brains we have a lot of mechanical movement of the brain to stabilize so having repaired the duotomy we now uh, melt more vaseline using the low temperature core tree so we don't push or scrape on the drive we just let uh, gravity do its um, uh, job of uh, forming a column of Vaseline beneath the drive shuttle here and around the probe and above. Another reason to put the Dura gel is that if you do happen to overheat the Vaseline, you have at least a, a layer of insulation between it and the brain. Particularly, again, if you're thinking about top layers, you don't want to burn the brain by accident. So here we have uh, a finished Vaseline column where we've surrounded anything that needs to move in Vaseline. We have our drive here floating above the brain. And what we do now, really quite simply, is pour on cement. And so what you can see here is I've surrounded the back of the drive, come over the shoulders, and a little bit up the holder tool, and really just uh, uh, put, filled this entirely with uh, light-cured cement. I strongly recommend um, the light-cured cement because it's quick to work with. And also, um, in the full detailed surgical protocol on the website, you'll find that it's a direct-to-bone adhesive. So we don't need screws, skull screws, for mechanical reasons. I have one here for ground reference uh, uh, as a reference electrode, but certainly don't need screws to, to secure an implant. So it's kinder on the animal and faster on the surgery, quicker, on the, quicker for the surgeon too. What we do then with the drive um, partially um, secured to the skull is release the connector from above and the cable will form a loop and we will just run Vaseline around the surface of that cable and in the eye of that loop we'll fill it with Vaseline again because we don't want cement to go here, we want that to be able to move downwards with the drive and the probe. And so here we are in the next step where we've literally again repeated that process, protect everything with Vaseline that needs to move and then entomb it in cement. And you'll see here I've also brought the cement above the holder tool so that now in the nearly final step when we remove the holder tool we have a little rim of cement here with a countersunk screw. It's entirely up to you how much you want to countersink the screw. This is potentially quite useful because the animal is not going to be able to interfere with that screw in any way, either in its housing or if you're thinking about working with small primates, little fingers and so on could get in here. Uh, an adaptation for uh, medium to larger animals is there's no reason at all not to have this entire assembly uh, inside a protective chamber, a protective cap. That's entirely straightforward to achieve. Um, and here we go back to what we started with, which is a multi-target. Well, how do we do a multi-target approach? Let's just spend a moment to talk about that as well. In this example, here we have um, a surgery in a cat where we have three probes going in. So I've got one here, which is partially implanted, another one here partially implanted. You can just see the probes going in. And here's the third one in a, an earlier stage where we're yet to form that uh, column of Vaseline, we're yet to do the dural repair. So really, it's, it's quite straightforward to think about doing multiple implants subject to your um, steric considerations of getting everything in based on your anatomical targets. Um, just go back, sort of step in, in the protocol, tack the drive in place a little, release the holder, bring the next one in and repeat that process. And then the final step would be repair the durotomy. Everything that needs to move, continue, continue, continue filling with Vaseline and then cap everything off with cement and in this case we did fit a uh, custom made chamber around all of the implants so the animal could not uh, disturb it or damage it. Other variations on the theme, so um, primates, large animals say with uh, large amounts of mechanical movement of the brain uh, or, and or head fixed animals where we have daily acute penetrations. Um, the probes will not penetrate dura Suffice to say, they might penetrate mouse dura, but in general, certainly not going to penetrate much more than that. And so there's a requirement to remove the dura in this case. Um, but then what we want to do, you know, if we're thinking about primates, where we have the brain moving an awful lot just with cardiorespiratory movement, we want to stabilize that before implanting the probe. So we put a pretty thick couple of millimeters of gel, which is sort of an elastic uh, membrane above the uh, brain. And then that won't be enough in its own so what we want to do is repair the skull as well but we're going to just check we're going to measure the trajectory make sure we have a clear entry for the probe register the brain surface so we have a reference point take the probe away put a big blob of vaseline over our desired trajectory and then fill with cement 
final step is then to remove that Vaseline, just melt it and wick it out, and you're left with a smaller window in the skull and a penetratable membrane through which you can pass your probe. Now, it might be that you do this as a chronic implant, but what you've done here, if you're doing chronic implant in a primate, is you've stabilized the brain and given yourself a good shot at getting the probe in safely without damaging the tissue. And if you could just look at this as acute head fixed, uh, sorry, daily head fixed animals where you just need a, a good window to penetrate probes through. And um, the key thing about this is that you're going to reduce scar tissue formation. So the classic approach in head fixed animals is you sort of open up the brain, stick in the probe, and then close off with some quicksil silicone, come back tomorrow. And after about four or five days, it's really very difficult. Connective tissue starting to reform. It's very difficult to get the probes in. It's also potentially painful and stressful for the animals. So there's a possibility that using this approach in your head fixed animals will extend their useful working lifetime as well. I will um, summarize very quickly that there's a number of features about probes, you know, they're tiny, the electrodes are really close together, and they're very good signal to noise, tiny footprint implants, optogenetics ready, and it's quite straightforward surgery. And there's a lot of benefits that accrue from those features. I won't read them all, but I'll let you digest them in your own time. And finally, just to summarize, so we've talked about what silicon probes are, how to get the best from them, how to build in fiber optics to give yourself uh, multifunctional implants, how to scale up to different brain areas, how to work with acute head fixed or how to work with chronic freely behaving. And of course, I'm sure you have many more questions. It's very hard to do all of this in, in 45 minutes or so, but please do feel free to get in touch if you have additional um, wishes, want to discuss anything. It'd be a pleasure to talk to you. Okay, so our, our first question then is, um, Why is it that your probes seem to offer excellent chronic uh, single unit stability where other electrode choices tend to struggle? That's a good question. Um, there's no single straightforward answer to that because I think there's a multiple, a multiple of uh, variables that come into uh, when, when you think about the, uh, the implant procedure and the probes themselves have properties which are conducive to keeping neurons alive and giving you good single unit uh, a good signal to noise, a good data yield. The drives themselves are really small and mechanically robust. The implants are small and reducing shear forces and leverage on the animal's heads. Perhaps another factor I mean, we didn't talk about today, but much of my, my own data was wireless head stages, so there was no tethering forces. Having said that, though, people have re replicated the data with tethered head stages. Um, yeah. It, it, device, that, that flexibility that we looked at between the probe, perhaps that's a factor as well in reducing that compliance mismatch between the probe and the, and the tissue. There's no single best answer, I'm afraid, but it's a very okay. good question. Perfect. Another question is, how do you go about reducing the sensitivity of your probes to light-driven photoelectric artifacts? Can you comment on that? Uh, um, yeah, I think I think that there's there's a two two pronged attack here, which is um, you can you can play with the chemistry of the silicon itself to try to mitigate or quench evoked currents from from the photoelectric artifact, and the other thing you can do is is um, try to reduce the uh, amount of light actually striking the electrode surface in the first place. So you could think of a, a cloak of sorts. More than that, um, I, I'd be giving away a very important trade secret that competitors would absolutely love to understand. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close my mouth at that point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, that's a good answer. Thank you. Yana has asked how deep you can go into the tissue with the probe. And similarly, Franklin has asked, um, have you tried positioning the probes into more deeper brain structures like the amygdala, PAG, and what are the caveats of doing that? Good question, and of course I completely neglected to mention the length, the, pen the implantable lengths of the probes. So at present, the uh, probes come in lengths of six, eight, or nine millimeters. So you're going to get everywhere in a mouse, uh, pretty much every most of a rat and, and similarly sized brains. Um, we are, there are efforts afoot to develop longer probes, 20 or 25 millimeters long, uh, for larger animals and deeper structures. That is work that's, that's going to commence this year and uh, reasons to be optimistic about it. But for the time being, certainly for larger animals, primates and so on, we, we are rather restricted to uh, nine millimeters or thereabouts of implantable length. I would mention in that context, though, that the, 
the shuttle on the nano drive is actually designed to travel five millimeters. Um, and the last two and a half of those is that the, if you can imagine the shuttle overreaches beyond the bottom of the drive. So you can offset some of the, if you you can reach into a deep craniotomy, so you can offset some of the skull thickness so you don't lose length on your probes. So that, that's a bit of a novel feature on the drives too. Okay, perfect. Hopefully that answers Franklin and Yana's questions. Um, maybe this is just a, a comment you had talked about the software available from Ken Harris's lab and um, Jeffrey mentions that there's a new tool for spike sorting called KiloSort, and he wonders if you've tried that. Yeah, KiloSort's entirely compatible uh, with these probe arrays. I think it, it's it's a personal choice what you prefer to use. They're, they're both developed by the same group, and they, they're going to give you very similar or identical outputs. Um, if you're using probes that have, say, multiple shanks, groups of 16 electrodes, let's say, then cost of quick is going to be uh, absolutely up to the task of, of working with that bandwidth of data. If you're using, for example, the uh, straight line 64 channels on a single probe, single shank, um, perhaps Keylasort would be better to work with that. It's simply a faster algorithm that's going to churn through it a lot quicker. But the, out the output should be the same. There are, I think also in Keylasort, there are some um, features to track or compensate for mechanical drift over time as well. So if the probe moves a little, or the brain moves a little over time, I think you can correct that in Kilosaur, whereas you can't in cluster quick. So that might be, depends on the stability of your implant and the application that you have in front of you, that might be a, a game changer for you. Okay, perfect. Tal, we've had a couple questions come in about the possibility to reuse chronic probes. Can you comment on that? I get asked that a lot. Yeah, so, so the answer is yes and no. Um, you've got to think about the construction of the implant and the the way it's built. It's mechanically, it's quite fragile to pull that off the animal, break it all apart, and rescue uh, a probe. I, when I tried originally, my success rate was well below fifty percent, and my headache rate was pretty much about eighty. <laughs> so I think I think I gave up on it in the end and thought, well, it probably isn't cost effective. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is you then need to test your uh, uh, electrodes to make sure that they are um, what you think they are before putting it back into another animal. Um, the device for doing that is called a Nano Z impedance tester. They're about uh, nearly 4,000 bucks. So if you haven't got one, that, that's, that's a bit of an opportunity cost. And second thing is if your sites are not what they were when they're originally made, regrettably, I cannot share with you the recipe that we use to get them down to those low impedances. So whilst in principle you could try it, and I respect that people are on a budget, it's worth having a try, but it's pretty hard. Probably when you think about your labor and you factor that in, it's not cost effective. So I think it's safest to say chronic probes, uh, consider them as consumables. On the other hand, very quickly, the good news is the nano drives are designed to be harvested and reused given their pretty robust stainless steel construction. So that that's a, a cost saver right there. Great. Okay. We have a question here. It's it's maybe not so much geared towards your technology. It's a it's a question, a general question about optogenetics that maybe you can answer. The question is, is it possible to inject the virus in one brain structure and stimulate another structure considering there are neural projections between both? structures. Has anyone ever tried that with success that you know? Yeah, I, I think the answer to that is yes, subject to a couple of caveats. And so imagine you're injecting, let's say, a brainstem nucleus and you're you're waiting for the opsin to transport to terminals that project somewhere. Um, you could stimulate the nucleus itself and, and orthodromically uh, activate spikes, or you could try and stimulate at the level of the terminals. I, I think it's, it's it's a little more gray what happens when you stimulate terminals because um, a, a subject to let's say a sort of certain lability of response they may or may not respond and, and it's not quite clear necessarily um, there are also terminals are likely to be spread over a much larger area diffuse area compared to a, a nucleus where you've got a dense cluster of cell bodies so yes it's possible but uh, it's not necessarily plain sailing if that's how you design your experiment in the first place okay perfect Let's ask one more question, just uh, keeping an eye on the time. And Natiel has asked, is it possible to use your silicone probes in other tissue types? 
like muscle, presumably, I don't know if that's skeletal muscle, but can you comment on other applications for those probes? As far as I know, nobody's used it in muscle. Um, you, you could be the first. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd love to hear how that goes. Um, in terms of outside the brain, uh, spinal cord, dorsal root ganglia, and so on, um, peripheral nerves are possible, not necessarily the easiest targets to get to. And, and perhaps there, there are reasons to think that um, flexible technologies are more appropriate there. But again, that's, it's certainly possible to penetrate a probe into a nerve. And if you think about those very small sight probes, the, the H1 with those tiny sites, five micron sites, um, it's quite attractive to imagine what that might do inside a peripheral nerve. One would imagine you could pick up myelinated axon single unit resolution. But uh, no, not muscle, not gut. Um, but um, yes, I'd love to know if you do that.